Welcome everybody to the Smart Connector podcast. My name's Jane Baylor and guess what? I have another fantastic guest for you and it's Ian Genius. Welcome Ian. How are you doing Jane? I'm doing very well, thank you. So Ian, you actually call yourself the world's stupidest genius. So you might think, what what does he mean by that? How can a genius be stupid, right? So it's all about keeping sales and sales conversions stupidly simple, right? That's what we're going to talk about tonight, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, Einstein said that genius is the art of making complex ideas simple. Well, I'm Ian, the world's stupidest genius, making sales six-year-old simple. Six-year-old simple. And this is something you actually came to talk to my Ideal Client Success Accelerator group the other day and delivered an absolutely fantastic presentation on this topic. And just to talk about uh, six-year-old simple, could you just elaborate a little bit on that, Ian? Because it's a very important concept, isn't it? Yeah. So typically, you know, a client will come with a problem mm. and the business has a solution. Yeah. And the client needs the help and the business need the business. But unfortunately, one of the biggest frustrations for all businesses is how many of those conversations fizzle out. It doesn't matter if it was getting rid of anxiety. It doesn't matter if the person needed a new printer. It doesn't matter if it was some marketing strategy. They've got a problem. You've got the solution and they come for a conversation. Most deals are decided on the back of a face-to-face -face phone call, Zoom call. There's some human interaction. Yeah. And unfortunately, one of the biggest frustrations is how many of those conversations fizzle out. Yeah. You know, they get to the end of yet another 40 minute discovery call, sales call, sales meeting, whatever you want to call it. Yep. Only to hear those dreaded words. We'll have a think about it. Oh, yes. We'll have a think <laughs> about it. Oh. Vanished. Yes. Or they say something like, it's a great service, but not for us right now, mm -hmm. as if it might be in an hour, in a day, in a week. In a couple of weeks, but unfortunately, that never happens. Or it's a fob some, off. Yeah, it's a fob off. Or sometimes they even say, we're going to do that at the end of February. Unfortunately, now it's the 15th of March and you've never seen them again. And something's gone wrong. They had a problem. You had the perfect solution, but that conversation fizzled out. It went wrong. Well, yes. And I think the one of the things that we talked about when you came to present to my group is that a lot of experts who sell their own services, because that's who we're talking about tonight, we're talking about solopreneurs, they're called. So people who they're independent and they sell services. And as you said, they have a problem that they have a solution to a problem that their clients or their prospects have, right? But a lot of them, they haven't had training in sales. Maybe they don't come from a sales background and they just think that this stuff should come naturally. So Ian, what's your response to that? Well, again, if it, you could have the greatest product, you could have the greatest service known to mankind, but before clients choose you can use you right before they can use you first they have to choose you mm. and that's where it goes wrong now again if you've worked for a big business and you loved marketing and then you thought i'll set up my own business marketing there was a sales team for all this stuff before mm. and now it's you or if you're in some accountancy business and someone was there getting all the business and you were dealing with the business but suddenly now that's you and you've got this rotating hat you're the marketeer and the accountant and the business development manager and the salesperson and unless you get people to choose your service it doesn't matter how brilliant it is because no one's going to ever use it and then this comes the problem that most 90 percent, i would suggest 90 percent of passionate heart-driven solopreneurs love helping clients love providing their fantastic service and hate selling. 
Yeah. To be a success, they've got to improve the outcome of these conversations. Mm -hmm. What's the solution to that? Get better at selling. They hate selling. Well, I know in life that if you hate doing something, if you detest doing it, if you despise doing it, if it fills you with fear, how likely you are going to get good at that? How likely Mm -hmm. does anyone ever get good at the thing they despise? Yeah. Not very. That's true. No, absolutely not. And I think, you know, for somebody like me, I mean, I spent, I suppose, my whole career in marketing and sales, and it definitely gives me an advantage, let's just say, when it comes to selling my own services. But as you said, a lot of independent experts, you know, who sell anything really from finance to healthcare solutions to, I mean, really anything at all that is not sales or marketing, the thing that they know about is what they do. And that's the thing that they're passionate about. And yeah. so why should they really understand how to, you know, how to work with the laws of influence and persuasion or yeah. how to really, you know, get o- on the right side of sales psychology? It's not something that that people can just pick up overnight, is it? Well, the only job I've ever had, I did a degree in mathematics mm. in Nottingham, Robin Hood country yes. in, in England. Right. And I left there. And since the day I left there, I started in sales. I was the salesman that hated selling. Yes. Now, I wasn't confident selling myself. I was uncomfortable bringing up my price. I didn't like asking awkward questions. I found most of the sales approaches were sleazy, pushy, dishonest, manipulative. I didn't like them. But the thing is, if you're not confident selling yourself, how can the potential client be confident buying? True. You know, if you don't believe you are the best, how can you expect them to believe you're the best? If you don't ask awkward questions and find out what's the core, what's really at the core of the problem they've got, you're never going to be able to give them the solution. So there's so many problems where you end up getting in your own way. Now, I've spent since 1998 as a salesman, Mm -hmm. right, 25 years. That's the only thing I've done. Now, some people, if they've just done marketing for 20 years or if they've done getting rid of anxiety for 25 years, we're all very good at a certain thing. Mm. But that one thing on its own is not enough. You know, it's just not enough. So you'd have to be about 7000 years old, wouldn't you? If you were if you'd spent 25 years in marketing and 25 years in this and you would be thousands of years old. And that's not reality. So somehow you've got to find a way to help those clients make much better buying choices. Mm. Yeah, I think you brought something up about pushy, sleazy, salesy, and manipulative. Th- those kind of, call them old style push marketing mm-hmm. and selling techniques, they don't work as well these days with online transparency because people have got a really wide choice, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I say to most people, is your service dishonest? They'll go, no, no, it's very honest. It's very ethical, high level of integrity. Well, have you ever been convinced to buy something that you've regretted? Have you ever been persuaded to attend an event that you wish you hadn't attended? They go, yes. Well, why would you want to persuade people and convince people when you can see there's an undercurrent of devious when there's nothing devious about your offering, you're honest, you're genuinely honest, helpful, caring. Mm-hmm. Why would you need to persuade and manipulate anyone? You don't need to. But that's but it's this. What do you do then? I need to get these clients on board. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, if you do come across as pushy, they will buy under duress. Yep. If they buy at all. <laughs> if they buy at all. Right. They'll either buy under duress or they will make some absolute rubbish up about having to run it past a wife who they don't even have (laughs) or they'll say they haven't brought their wallet even though they've just moved it from their front pocket to their back pocket out of view or they will buy under duress they'll regret with buyer's remorse they'll cancel abruptly and they will tell everyone to avoid it like the plague so you might get their business for about four and a half seconds then you won't And now no one will go anywhere near you again. 
Yeah, well, I mean, that's it, really. And I mean, personally, I think most service based business owners would really prefer not to have clients that felt they'd been tricked into becoming clients in the first place, because they're they're not going to be the happiest clients, are they? They have started off on the wrong foot, haven't they? They have. And who's the best salesperson of every business? The loyal clients, the loyal cheerleaders. So if you're trying to get them the trust and engagement up so they tell more people, and the first thing you're doing is sort of getting them to agree to something by putting them under pressure. Which one would you like, the blue one or the green one? And they're thinking, I haven't said I want it either. Yeah, the the, the famous alternative clothes. Yeah, and all this sort of stuff. When are you looking to start? And now you're in a fight or flight scenario because you didn't really want to start yet, but you're being sort of cajoled down at a cul-de-sac. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in my experience, those sales techniques, they work very well on children under the age of about five. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, yeah, any more than that, it requires a little bit more sophistication. So let's get into it in your secret sauce. So take us through it. Okay, so I was the salesman that hated selling, but my background was problem solving. I'd just done my degree in math. So I thought there must be a different way past this problem. What if the solution to getting more clients, everyone wants more clients, taking more services for more money. What if the solution was not getting better at selling? What if there was something else, right? So I started looking at why do people make bad choices? And I put it into three categories. The first one is if you're not confident selling yourself, how can they be confident buying? If you don't ask, if you make assumptions, they're going to, you're going to, if you don't think they'll pay that much money and then you don't mention that price and then you say, no one's buying my £3,000 service, you haven't told anyone it exists, right? So the first reason why the clients are making a bad choice is that people get in their own way. Right. So how do you become confident about selling your services? Because that's the problem. It's not getting better at selling. It's well, if the reason they're not buying is because they're not confident and the reason they're not confident is because I'm not confident. The problem is, how do I become more confident? Mm -hmm. So one way that I use with people is I say to them, look, if if I said to you, are you better than your competition? Mm -hmm. What would you say? Now, they'll often give an answer like, I think so. And I'm thinking the fact that you think so and you don't know so, right, is one of the reasons why your confidence is struggling. So I'll do a simple exercise and say, look at the cost of your service versus the competition. Look at the quality. Look at the quantity of things. Look at the value you do. Look at the skills you have, the experience you have, the time you're willing to give people. Break what you do down into lots and lots of categories. Because if you say, are you better than the competition? It's too hard to work Mm. out. But if you now compete against cost, you can say, yes, I'm better. Mm. Quantity, not so much. Quality. Now, once you paint it and you go, actually, I've won this 7-2. Yep. You not only know that you're better than the competition, but you know why. So it's about that. So that's an example of how you would tackle the confidence. And I think that's a very important point because it's also that's all about positioning. And the thing is, if you don't know where you sit in relation to your competition, then you're not really going to be able to communicate your value, are you? So you have to know that, don't you? Yeah. If you don't know, how can they know? They will only know what you know. So if you don't know, how they won't know. Yep. If you don't value yourself, don't be surprised when they don't value yourself. Mm. And when they don't value what they you do, there is one thing they will do. When they can't see the value, they will obsess with the price. And as soon as anyone makes a price choice, it's always a bad choice. Yeah. Because inst- I've got a problem. I could go to you, but I'm making a price choice. I'm not seeing value, so I'm making a price choice. Well, Cheaper than you is your cheaper, inferior competitor. They're not as good as you. They won't love me like you do. They won't help me like you do. But they're cheaper than that is I have a stab at it myself. I have a little go myself. I go on YouTube for three minutes. I read the first four pages of a book. 
and somehow that offsets 20 years of your experience. Mm. No, but that's what they do. And yes. cheaper than that, because that's cheaper, that's why they picked it, and cheaper than that is they do nothing and yeah. hope their problem vanishes on its own. It disappears just without any help. But that's what yeah. they do. They go to a cheaper competition, do it themselves badly or do nothing. The only reason they picked those three terrible options is that they could see price. And the only reason they saw price is they couldn't see the value. And again, if you don't value yourself, how can they see the value? It's one thing links to the next. Yeah. And I mean, I know certainly that the level of certainty that you project is incredibly important, isn't it? So for people who are actually struggling to believe in what they do, because when people get knockbacks and setbacks, even the strongest of us will think at times, is what I do, is it actually worth anything? Does anybody want it? Am I just kidding myself? They'll have all those questions going round and round in their heads. And then obviously they then start to doubt themselves and then that doubt comes through in that sales conversation. So what tip would you have for somebody who has, said, let's say, experienced quite a lot of uh, rejection and pushbacks and is now be beginning to doubt themselves and express that doubt in those conversations? Do you have yeah. any little tips? Yeah. And again, just on what you're saying, I have not studied body language. I have not studied tone of voice. But it stands to reason if someone isn't confident, it's projected through something, body language, tone of voice, the words we use. So tackling it, well, chance, if people have worked. Normally, a business, when they first start off, they'll often give some of their service away for either very little money mm. or they'll do it for actually no money as they're testing which bits work and which bits don't work. Yep. So one thing is to go back to an existing Someone that you've helped. Yeah. Now, chances are someone that you've helped actually still likes you, right? They like you because they like you anyway, and you've made an impact to their life. Yeah. So when you go back to someone else, firstly, they know you're not selling them anything because they've already bought it. Yep. Right? And just say, look, I know it's been probably a couple of years since we last worked together, but can I just ask, I mean, did it make an impact to your life? Did it make an impact? Whatever it was, it could have made an impact to their work performance, an impact to their family life, an impact yep. to their sleeping patterns, whatever it was. Did it make an impact? At that point, most people, because they know they're not selling and being bought anything, you know, they'll be honest. This person's transformed their life in many cases. The price is irrelevant. They will tell them, <clears throat> oh, it made a tremendous dip difference. You, that's fantastic. You say it made a tremendous difference. What difference did it make? Oh, my productivity was up. Before you know it, they're going to tell you, what, 10%? So, yeah, we, our business made £30,000 more that year. Really? So, what, well, I charged you about £1,000, and on the back of it, you made £30,000. Yeah. Suddenly, your confidence is skyrocketing, or it's something else. It's like, yeah, yeah right. I, my relationship with my, I, we were going to marriage counselling and with your help, we've, we're now back together, our, our families. You, it's from the results of the people that you've already worked with. You're not trying to sell them more. You're just trying to say, look, I helped you out. Can you give me an idea of what it did? And if, once you've gone to three, four, five people you've worked with, whether it was for free, a fraction of the price, irrelevant. That's not the point. You will see the value when people tell you, and often it will, nine times out of 10, it will surprise people. I did this as an exercise for someone. He was showing them clarity and he charged them about a couple of hundred quid. I said, can you arrange a meeting with me, you, and the person that you helped? And I will just hand the reins to me and I'll just ask a series of questions, nothing too prying. In one case, this company made something like 60,000 pound of profit on this hundred, couple of hundred pounds of his clarity course. And another one had made about 40,000 pound in turnover. He never knew any of this before. Mm. But coming out of this meeting he was, like, I don't believe it. Literally, this business is completely turned around on the back of it. So that's, if you want to know what your impact does, 
find out. Yeah, I, I think that's so important, yeah. Ian, because that thing about social proof really is that is the evidence, isn't it, that everyone is looking for. It's the evidence that helps you sell with confidence because you're not then just talking about what you could do in a airy fairy kind of a way. You've got proof, right? Yeah. And then, of course, if you can actually uh, put that proof in front of people and actually put a name to it and put results to it and put statistics and data in front of them, all the, you know, all the, that lack of trust, it starts to kind of fall away, doesn't it? Yeah, so but it's not just imagine. for them. It's not just, I'm not talking about just getting a review, whether it's a written review or a, a video review. And I'm not talking about getting a case study. Mm. I'm talking about when this person goes and he finds that their marriage was saved and this person made this money. Yeah. If they didn't write it on any pieces of paper, yeah, But the value to them, they're doubting themselves that this even works. They're doubting whether they start to feel like a fraud. All this, you know, imposter syndrome starts creeping in. They speak to 10 people. And for seven people, it made a tremendous difference. Without a single piece of paper, without a review in sight, it's their own value. They go in, that works. It works. Yeah. I'm not doubting myself anymore. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the comment that you made about, Look, if you don't have if you don't have that right now, if you let's say you're launching something new, it, it's got to be a priority, hasn't it, to get that proof. So you recommended drop your prices, you know, get to offer it for free if you have to. Yeah. But you have to get you have to get that proof, don't you? You have to get the proof so you can give the proof to other people and yeah. you have to get the proof for yourself. I mean. Every when, when people make breakfast cereals, they don't make the breakfast cereal. You know, they first they they go right test. They do to testing centres or before a computer game's released. They give it to people before a film's released. Mm. They show it to an audience of people. Say, what do you like? They say which bits they like, and then they change it. It's nothing different. I mean, you wouldn't. You, you've got to try it out and work out which bits work, which bits don't. If someone then gives you a glowing review, use it. But as, as much as getting a review and saying, yes, it does this, it changed my life, for you personally, you go, I know it works. Mm -hmm. Because it all stems from there. It's, before you can demonstrate the value, you've got to believe it yourself. Yeah. So other tips in, I mean, you are full of such value. What else do you pe yeah. people come to you with and say, look, so, I, it's where I'm stuck? Okay, so a completely different thing then right? Mm. So let's take a lot of businesses will tell you the thing they do. And depending on how complicated the thing they do is, depends on whether you understand it, right? So I'm going to pick one. I do VoIP, right? <laughs> VoIP. And everyone's going, oh, that's wonderful. I have absolutely no idea what VoIP is. <laughs> right? and does, it, does everyone know here what VoIP is and someone goes mm, not sure and they say it's voice over internet protocol I go oh thank you so much and everyone's still thinking I have no idea what voice over internet protocol is right mm -hmm. it's a brilliant solution but I have absolutely no idea to what right do I come in with a broken leg can I not sleep you know, is my TV not working? What does it, I don't, it's a great thing, but I don't know what it does. People sell the solution. But nine times out of 10, people don't know they've even got the problem in the first place. Mm. So if you say, I do this, that's great. But if I don't think I've got the problem, right, I'm not interested in what you've got. Again, yeah. take a doctor scenario. If you went to the doctor and they said, sit down. And you go, and the doctor said, you, you hadn't opened your mouth. Went, Hi, Jane. Hello. I've, I've got a cream for you. <laughs> what? I, I haven't told you what's wrong with me yet, doctor. The solution is the cream. The solution is the, you know, but I've, it's, it follows the problem. I don't know if I've even got a problem. Most people don't tell you the problem that they solve or the impact that it makes. Mm -hmm. What they do is they tell you the middle bit. Yeah. I do spiritual alchemy. I don't know what that does. What would I come to you with? What problem would I have where, <laughs> where spiritual alchemy was the solution? 
And not only that, I don't know what the impact would be either. You know, if they said, I do spiritual alchemy and now you can fly around the room, at least I'd know what it does, but I wouldn't know what it solves. But most people sell the middle bit. Mm. Now, if anyone's here had a conversation with someone that does mortgage advice or financial advice, or they're mm. an IT specialist or an SEO specialist, mm. they will check that you understand. At some point, they will tell you loads of details about these subjects and then they'll check that you understand and they'll go, they'll say something like, does that make sense? Do you understand? Is that clear? <laughs> and most people don't really like putting their hand up and admitting how stupid they are. I do. I'm a stupidest genius, but most people would rather pretend than to admit their stupidity. So they get asked a question about mortgages. All the information's gone flying over their head. They've got no idea what they what they were talking about. The person said to them, I feel like we're leaving a chocolate proboscis only to enter a hinterland of negation. And I feel that contemporaneity is the synchronicity between time and culture. Does that make sense? And they go, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Right. It doesn't make any sense. Right. In all sales is they have a problem and you've got a solution. They're trying to make the best choice. Mm -hmm. right? No one in life is trying to make a bad choice. They're trying to make a good choice. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand, that means you're guessing. Right. Whatever you don't understand, you're guessing. And this is the big problem for businesses. Businesses want them to pay them in money for whatever they do. Whatever it is they do, they want money. If I don't understand what it does, what impact it makes, what problem I've got, I'm guessing. And I don't like guessing for money. Yeah, very important point. Absolutely. And I, I think just to go back to this whole issue of just, I suppose, making assumptions and thinking that people understand the problem that they have better than they do, really. I think that's a really important point, because obviously in marketing, we know that there are different levels of awareness and that it's always more effective if you can sell to people who they just have a they're just coming into an awareness of the problem or they're actually problem unaware and you're bringing them to the point of illumination because when you get higher up that hierarchy and they're actually shopping around or they're ready to buy or whatever that's when all the competition comes crowding in mm. so if you can do that job earlier on in the sales cycle when they are just beginning to really understand that issue then you stand a much better chance, don't you, of making a sale if you can bridge that gap for them. Yeah. Again, on that note, right, if the stupidest words ever are, does that make sense, right, because does that make sense doesn't make any sense. The opposite, when you reveal that moment where they didn't realise they had a problem until you've revealed it, because it's always been that way, you know, that mentality, it's always been that way. And then you show them that it doesn't always need to be. When they say the words along the lines of, I never thought of it like that. That's the bingo moment. When they say, I never thought of it like that. That's the moment where you've just turned their world upside down. Yep. They, they, they never saw it like that before. Yes. And I think that's very important. I like the way you call it the bingo moment. Um, yeah. So this, the, that that's a cue. That's basically a sign that you've done something right. Yeah, because people will often sort of lie to cover to to make them feel self feel better or defend themselves. So, for example, I said to someone, I mean, if you, I said, how if you had ten conversations, how many would say yes? Now he said seven out of ten. Right? If someone says seven out of ten, one of three things is happening. Either they've either worked with me before, but I've got Alzheimer's because I don't remember it, right? They're a pathological liar because the last time they got seven out of 10 was one week in 1984. And even then that was three out of 10, right? Mm. Or they're not charging enough money. 
So I carried on. He said, seven out of 10. I said, that's wonderful. Not believing any of it. I said, just out of interest, when these seven people out of 10 say yes, do you have like a good, better, best package? He said, yeah. I said, which one helps the client the most? He said, it's our best. I said, how many of the seven take the best? He said, one. So I said, why don't you stop telling me the cobblers about seven out of 10 and focus on the fact that six of the seven aren't taking the most help, right? Mm -hmm. Of the seven people that you're claiming say yes to you, but six of the seven aren't taking the most help from you. They're only taking a little bit of help. Yeah. And when he saw it like that, he was like, oh, yeah, I'm getting seven out of 10, but I'm not getting seven naff yeses. They're seven half, they're half good yeses. They're not brilliant. If the client takes, if they're recommending five things and the Mm. client takes one, well, five minus one means four weren't taken. Mm -hmm. They recommended those four for a very good reason and the client decided to not take them. So they missed out on the help. So the client didn't win. And because they didn't take four, the business didn't win. So no one won. The client got less help. They got less business. It was a yes. It just wasn't a very good yes. Yeah, I I get that. And in fact, that is a very big issue, isn't it? Because a lot of, well, in fact, most service providers or experts will have a tier tiered offers, right? So they'll have they'll have their kind of premium offer, which is the one that they'd really like to be selling all day, every day, because they can make three times as much as with any other uh, product. And they might have a one or more product sort of in between a light version and a, a slightly only more advanced version or whatever. And then they might have the kind of throwaway or the giveaway or the downsell or whatever. And that is not un- uncommon for a service-based business. So yeah. what would be your advice to those people that wanted to sell more of their premium offers? Yeah. So again, it, it can't be priced. People will think it can't be priced now because they're saying yes. Yeah. They've become a client, but they're picking the cheaper option. Yep. Right. They're taking the bronze instead of the gold. They're taking one of the mm-hmm. five. They're using them for a month instead of a year. It's still the same issues. They're yeah. not seeing the value of the premium service because yeah. they're, they're saying yes, enough to be a client, which is not as bad as before. They're not saying no. They're not saying one of these horrible palm off lines, mm. but they're still not seeing the extra value of the premium service. So again, they're now back to focusing on price. So instead of going to the competition themselves and nothing, they're picking the cheaper options. So they're still obsessed with price. So it still comes down to you're not showing the value. You're not really, they don't fully understand how bad their problem is. Or maybe you're still not complete. You don't value the gold service. So how do they? So it doesn't, the good news is it's not a different set of problems. It's the same problems again. Yeah. And I think as you were saying that, I had a bit of a light bulb moment as well, Ian, because you talking about, well, maybe they don't value the platinum service or whatever, or maybe they secretly think that it's too expensive. I mean, that's a mindset thing, isn't it, really? And we don't believe in the value of our most premium offer and the fact that it is just the thing that enables us to serve our clients at the highest level and get the very best results and just be the most glorious version of ourselves because they're actually enabling us to be that person, then we're always going to do the downsell to the middle tier, aren't we? Or the lowest, because it it matches what's going on in our heads, doesn't it? Yeah, It doesn't match what their wallet is. It doesn't match how much money they have or their ambition. It matches the assumptions that we think they're willing to pay. Yeah. Maybe you mentioned the gold for about, two, three or four seconds and straight you're onto the middle tier because you think that's where your confidence is. Again, confidence. If my lad is playing football and he thinks he's playing against a division higher team before he's even got to the ground, he's already telling me how he's going to lose the game. (laughs) Right. That's so funny. It's mindset. I mean, he might have lost the game anyway, but if you go into onto a field for 90 minutes and you've lost it because you think you're going to lose before you've even trod on the grass, it's very hard to win from that position. Yeah. And what, 
you know what, Ian, even my dog has that issue, you know, because he really thinks of himself as an elite athlete. You know, he's very good at catching balls and, uh, you know, loves running around and chasing them. And when there's a dog that runs a lot faster than him, he totally loses confidence and he refuses to participate. And so it's just a universal thing. It's do- animals have it, dogs have it. Children have it, we have it, and we have to challenge it, don't we, in ourselves? And again, there's all these different things. It could be a conversation fizzling out. It could be a conversation they say yes, but then they're always settling for the low ticket yeses. Mm -hmm. The other version, there is one more version. If someone says, I'm getting lots of yeses, people are always saying yes to me. They're taking the silvers and the golds and the platinums. Mm. There's normally one remaining problem, and it's that they're not charging what the service is truly worth. Mm -hmm. So they are taking all the premium offers. The problem is the premium offer isn't at the premium price. Yeah. Or it is, but then they're constantly discounting it back down again to not the premium price. So it's one of those three frustrations. They're sick of, they're gutted about being ghosted. They're sick of settling for low ticket yeses or they're struggling to charge what their service is worth. Yep. Yep. And the thing is, I've often seen people saying, bragging about how many clients they've got and how they're completely rushed off their feet with clients and overwhelmed. And it's like, well, I don't really think that's a good thing because if you are exhausted and you have so many clients that you don't know what to do with them. I mean, what kind of experience is that really for the clients? It's better really for clients to be, you know, fully delighted with what you do. And if they're getting the most burnt out, exhausted, thinly spread version of yourself, then that's not good either, is it? No, it isn't good. It's always the same number. It's always the number of clients multiplied by the number of things they take multiplied by the number of the amount of money. If yeah. one of them's either ridiculously cheap or very few things they take or very few clients, it doesn't matter which of the things it is. Mm. But yeah, if they say I'm rushed off my feet, well, chances are you're not charging enough money because otherwise you're having to constantly work. It's like not quite a busy fool. But you're having to constantly run around because you're not making enough from any one of them to stop you. You could slow down if you could, you know, charge what it was truly worth. Yeah, totally. And the thing is, all of this stuff is so incredibly valuable because obviously in my program, I help people put together really good offers and I help them package them up. So I help them get that messaging and language system around what they do. But the thing is, they can have all of that. If they fall at the last hurdle, which is the conversion, then none of that value actually gets out into the world. So I think it is just so, so important. What you do is just incredible, Ian. And it's what so many people need. It really is when they're selling their own services. If you are listening to this and you don't have a professional sales and marketing background and you're selling your services and you haven't been trained by somebody like Ian, I definitely think you ought to get on a call with him. And so on that note, Ian, what is the best way to get in touch with you anyway? Well, my website is iangenius.co.uk yeah if people are on linkedin if you can't find ian genius on linkedin something seriously gone wrong i'm the only <laughs> ian genius with an ian genius alternative to selling <laughs> yeah and before you go as well what something that caused great hilarity and debate amongst my client group is they really wanted to know is genius your real last name Or is that like your kind of stage name? There is one way to find out. And that's when I invoice you. (laughs) So when you've come to me and you've gone on a a seven year training course and I've sent you your invoice, you'll be able to find out. Am I really ingenious or is it all an an elaborate ruse? Oh, there you go. You see. So, I mean, that is, you know, keep everybody in suspense then, Ian. I think that's definitely the thing to do. So go and spend your money on Ian Genius. And after seven years, he will reveal the answer. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> All right. Well, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you join us tonight, Ian. I've really enjoyed the conversation. And uh, would you like to talk about, uh, you know, have you got a free resource that you'd like to give away to our listeners and viewers? If so, I'll put it in the show notes. I've got a copy of my book. It's called The Perfect Pitch. It's a 65 page book. It's, it shows you how to stand out and stay remembered. So I'll put that in absolutely free. I'll put the link in. Well, that's absolutely amazing. What an incredible gift. So thank you very much again, Ian. It has been a pleasure. And yeah, look forward to seeing you again soon. Cheers, Em.